Good morning. Good morning. Let's stand, please. It's good to see you this morning. Um, if you're joining us here in person, welcome. And if you're joining us online, welcome as well. We're just glad to be able to worship Him together today. Again, in spirit and in truth, we ask the Holy Spirit to teach us what that really means. That we can be genuine. And His Holy Spirit will lead us into how to worship the Father. He is the honored guest, so let's just welcome Him. Father, we welcome You and we praise You today. We bless your mighty name, Father God. We do not discount, Lord, or we do not want to put anything else ahead of you because, Father, there's no need to gather in this worship experience unless you're here. We're here to honor you, Lord, not to just that we enjoy people, we enjoy one another, but the main reason we're here, Lord, is together to lift you up, to honor you, to bless you, and Lord, your word tells us that if you're lifted up, you draw men to yourself. So, Father, we need drawing today. We need to be close to your heart, Lord. So help us to do that. Help us to lift you up. We pray this prayer, Jesus.
Amen. I hope that is true. It's not just a song. And I want us to do something this morning. Just, just stop me if you just close your eyes. I know everybody's still coming in and getting settled in. But just stop a moment. And just say thank you to God for something He's already done for you today. Just You can say it out loud or you can say it quietly. Just thank Him for something He's done for you already today. Thank you, Lord. An awesome God. And welcome to Open Arms Fellowship. It's so good to see you here together to thank our Lord and worship our Lord and celebrate Him together as a church family, as a body of Christ. And it's so good to see you. If this is your first time, you should have found a card somewhere close to you, somewhere on that aisle that you're sitting on. And this card is a way for you to connect with us because we want to connect with you and help you on the journey of discipleship because we want to win the low country and impact the entire world of Jesus Christ. And we need your help in doing that. Maybe you got a prayer request. That's a great place to put that on that card. Maybe you got a question about all those shoe boxes back there and this Thanksgiving meal thing we do and you just don't you've heard stuff but you don't understand, just use the card. I like the card. You can put it in the offering box, which is right over there against the wall beside the picture, and it will get to me. And I love to get cards. And I love to just celebrate our family. Family. Maybe you don't feel like you have family. You got family in here today. And we're going to celebrate our Father, our Heavenly Father. If you would like to join me in prayer, we're going to have a great family prayer time together. You're invited to join us right here at the altar if you want to. You're invited to pray at the foot of the cross if you want to. You're invited to pray right there where you are as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, thank You for being a perfect. And, and we don't even know what perfect really means. But thank You for being perfect. And thank You for being holy, holy, holy. Absolute holiness. Without any blemish. Without any defect. Not one single thing wrong with you. <laughs> God, I can't imagine that, but I know it's true. And I know you displayed yourself when you took on flesh and you walked among people just like us, showing us the awesomeness and the perfectness of Almighty God Jesus when you as we get ready to celebrate your birthday on earth, as you chose to come down and be a human among humans while still being God, even that blows our mind because it's true. You were, you are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for living among us. Thank you for saving your word, protecting your word that displayed this is how we're supposed to live. Like Jesus did, a human, but God. Thank you for dying for us, Jesus. I, I, I can't ever comprehend enough what took place. I don't think I ever will. Probably not even in heaven will I comprehend fully what you did for me and for every person in this room and for every person ever born. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for us. May we give our life to you in return. And oh, thank you. Jesus, I, every time I think about it, I hear those words you told those disciples. It's better for me to leave. And Lord, none of us would think it's better for you to leave, but you said it's better because I'm going to send my spirit. Thank you that your spirit is here with us. We're not serving a God way off that we can't touch, feel, or hear. We're serving a God who's right here. Lord, help us to really, really worship and really be attentive to the fact that, God, you're right here. You're speaking to us. And you want to just encounter us today. And so, God, give us a hunger. Give us a desire. Give us an openness of heart and mind. We're not just in church on Sunday morning. We're in the presence of all 
Almighty God who wants to have fellowship with us. Lord, may we fellowship with you. Lord, across the back, right there on the table, is a bunch of shoe boxes. And Lord, last night as I prayed over those boxes, I thought about that message of the dots connected. You know every boy and girl who's going to get one of those boxes. And you know the difference it's going to make. And Lord, as I pray my eyes now, I pray now, they'll have a blast with those toys. They'll be so excited and they will laugh. And, but God, that gospel track, may it be the life changer as they come to know Jesus, their Savior. Lord, in just over a week, we're going to give out plates and plates and plates of food. And Lord, I'm praying that people will enjoy that meal. It'll be one of the best meals they've had in a year. But Lord, that card, that salvation prayer, I'm praying they will come to know their Savior. While eating a piece of turkey, they read out a prayer and they confess their sin. And they call upon Jesus. Oh Lord, just use us and may you get the glory for what you already know is going to happen. You will be praised. You will be praised. Amen. God, I give you what I can today. Scattered ashes that I've hid away I lay it all At your feet From the corners of my deepest shame The empty places where I've worn your name Show me the love I say I believe Oh, help me to lay it down Hold on, I lay it down
Come on, Lord, I lay it down. Help me to lay it down. Oh Lord, I lay it down. Oh, let this be.
a hallelujah, and that's our weapon. Our weapon is our melody. So what we're doing right now, church, this is how we fight our battles. By lifting up a shout, lifting up a song, lifting up a praise to our God. And instead of focusing on whatever that battle is, whatever that problem is, we're focusing on Him. And we're saying all that other stuff, oh, He's going to take care of that. We're just going to lift up a shout, lift up a praise, and thanksgiving. Lord, we thank you this morning for who you are, God. We thank you that you are there to fight every battle that we may face. We thank you that you prepared a table for us. We thank you that your goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. Oh, Lord, we thank you. We can't help but to shout and to praise and to thank you this morning, Lord, that you fight our battles for us.
Uh, we've been talking about the power of partnership. And it is incredible power when the church, the body of Christ, when we come together and discover our giftedness and use our giftedness in the work of the kingdom. And, and it, there is a power that is magnified way greater than our individual powers because it is a gift from God working in His kingdom and it does amazing things. And, and I hope as we're going through this journey, we're all learning what our giftedness is. And if you haven't, then hang on. The journey's going to keep going. And then in January, we're going to start another Pathways to Partnership class where you can learn so much about yourself and what God is wanting to do in your life. And so we are to use our gifts to serve. Serve the Lord, serve others, serve one another. But I think there's something even more important and using our gift than even serving. Something that supersedes all that. Over the years, I've been given some really cool gifts at different times, some, some presents that have surprised me. Um, even this year, even this year, this is really cool because I came into 2020, I made a promise to the Lord. I don't make resolutions because. They're like Mary Poppins says. They're like high crust promises, easy to make, easily broken. I, I make a covenant with the Lord, and I tell the Lord, I'm not going to buy any more classic cars because I got a yard full. Woo! Amen. But you know what? He gave me a '55 Ford this year. He gave me a '67 Chevy van this year, and he gave me a Toyota pickup this year. I didn't buy any of them. All right. And so, you know, those people that God used to give me those gifts. There's no way I can repay them. There's no way. But, you know, the gift's a gift. And the gift is not to be given for a repayment. Um, a few years ago, the leadership team, which is more than a leadership team, they're my brothers. They took out some money and bought me a chainsaw. What are you talking about? Oh, wow. I can't repay them for that. A few years ago, my wife gave me a gift. Oh, that was a cool gift. She gave me the ultimate driving experience where I got to drive an exotic car on a professional road course. I got three laps on that road course. It's the closest I'll ever get to, to real racing. And man, that was so cool. One of the best gifts I've ever gotten. She surprised me with that. I love to get gifts. I'm excited about getting gifts, but I love to give gifts. Because I love to see the expression on people's faces when they open up a gift bigger than they were expecting. I love to give gifts to my two brothers, and, and especially the one who's got an old car he's working on, and I'm buying him parts through the years for his car, and he opens it up, and he's like, wow, you know, he didn't expect that. And so I love to give even more than I love to get. But you know, every time I get a gift, there's, there's, something, there's something about it. I feel like I, I need to do more than a thank you. I don't know, thank you just seems like it ain't enough. You know, I say thank you and I really mean to thank you, but I, I feel like I need to do something else. Even though I know that the true reason you give a gift is not to get something back, but I just feel compelled to, to do more than thank you. That's right. But, but the gift's a gift. But I do want to show my gratitude when I'm given a gift. I bet every one of us at some point in time, have received a gift that just kind of blowed us away. Wow, I didn't expect that. Man, you gave me that gift. And, and, and you know, we wanted to show our gratitude, but it was like, thank you. That, that's all? It's like, we wanted to do more than thank you, but, but the nature of a gift. You don't supposed to do anything in return. You're just supposed to say thank you uh, and show your gratitude. But, but it's just that hunger to, or the desire or something that moves us. I need to do more than just say thank you. But now we've got to be very careful that we don't fall into the climate of our culture. We have a growing culture of entitlement that says, well, you're supposed to give me something, and I don't even have to think about thanking you. You owe me something. And as much as we may say, well, you know, that's wrong, and we're not going to do it. Hey, it affects us. It affects us all. And we have to combat that attitude of an entitlement. Mm-hmm. If you're married, you probably know what it's like to have a spouse to ignore something you've done for them. 
<laughs> they may have ignored it totally, or maybe they saw it and they still didn't say thank you. If you married, then you have been that spouse who ignored what your spouse did for you and didn't say thank you like you should have. If you've got kids, then you know what it's like to do things for them and never get any sense of gratitude. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And parents, we got to start early. you got to start early. I love Diane's story before the praise team started talking about one of her grandkids and how early she said, thank you, Lydia. Glenn, way to go. Way to go. you got to start early because I'm telling you, if they ain't taught to say thank you by the time that 13 comes... You ain't going to get much of a thank you then. <laughs> That's right. So we, we know what it's like to do things for people, give gifts to people, and, and not get any sense of gratitude returned to us. And I thought about God. How much does God do for us every day? And He gets ignored. Oh, I know. We, we probably say thank you at the blessing. And that's good. We need to. But that's usually at the moment for that one thing. That's right. I mean, God, God gave us the air to breathe today. Amen. We wouldn't exist today without God giving us air. That beautiful sunshine shining out there, you know, that does more than brightens our day. It keeps us alive. We would freeze to death without it. God, God did that. You were able to get out of bed this morning. Maybe some of you ached a little, but you, you got out of bed this morning. You made it. God, God did that. God gave you the ability to move. Most of us have had something to eat today. God did that. How much more has God done for us today? We ain't we even thought about it today. So that brought me to this question. How can we show gratitude to God? How, how can we do this? I mean, He does so much for us. So, so what can we do? How can we show gratitude to Him for all the things that He, that he has done for us? I mean, we just look in the Bible and there's a whole journey of stuff that He's done for us. He's doing stuff for us right now. More stuff than we could ever imagine. And He's already promised to do a whole bunch more cool stuff for us. That's right. So how can we show gratitude to God? Well, one of the ways we can show gratitude is what we were just doing. Worship. worship. You know? When we worship the Lord. Now, that is an act of gratitude, but remember, He's worthy of worship and He's mm. commanded us to worship, so it's not just out of gratitude we're supposed to. <laughs> mm -hmm. How about giving? Giving a tithe to the Lord. Putting our money in the box back there. Well, that, that's, a, that's an act of thankfulness. But remember, He also commanded us to do that. <laughs> so there's an expectation. How about serving others? You know, that's got to be a great way to show gratitude to God. Well, it is, but He also commanded us to, to serve others. Hmm. So how can we just purely show gratitude to God? Maybe it's more simple than we realize. What if using our gift is gratitude to God? Just using the gift that God has given us for Him is showing gratitude to God. I mean, God has done so, so much for us, we could never, never repay Him. And you know the good thing is God does that. <laughs> and so He's not looking for us to repay Him. Because a gift is a gift. But God does have expectations for us. I mean, God does expect us to worship Him. God does expect us to, to give an offering to Him. God does expect us to serve one another. Man, He expects us to love Him and love others. He expects us to know His Word and obey His Word. So there's a lot of expectations. But how do we just show gratitude to God and all that He's done for us? I think about Jesus. You know, it's it's Christmas, man. You're going to have some presents pretty soon right around your tree. Yeah, it's, it's close, folks. It's close. <laughs> Jesus came. Amen. God took on Hallelujah. flesh. King of kings, Lord of lords, 
That's not just something that's going to happen in the future. It's always been. He's always been King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Always at the right hand of the Father. And yet He took on flesh and submitted Himself to the authority of sinful parents. Wow. And then, Jesus walked among sinful people, just like you and me. And for the first time in His existence, He became hungry, tired. Why? Because He became a human. That's right. While still being God. So that we could understand Him. Then, as He made His way to that cross, and I'm, I'm journeying through the book of Luke, and I'm just a chapter or two before the cross, and He took the humiliation, being spit on, His flesh being ripped, being nailed to the cross for sinners. I mean, He how can we ever thank Him for that? Can't. We can't repay Him. There's no way to pay Him back. But how can we thank Him for that? How can we show God gratitude? I think He's using the gift He gave us. Let's pray as we look at His Word. God, You are so good to us. Lord, I think it would blow our minds if we just stopped in our busyness and began to write a list of just what You've done for us today. Just today. Thank You, God. You are so good. And I thank You that You don't expect <coughs> us to pay You back because we could. There's no way. But You do expect gratitude. You expect us to be thankful people. You expect your children to be the most thankful people all the time, not just at Thanksgiving. And so Lord, as we look at Your Word today, show us that just using our gift is gratitude. And thank You for being so good to us. Amen. Amen. I do hope you have a Bible. <laughs> You can read and understand. Whether you're here or catching us on the internet, if you don't, I want to give you a Bible because I want you to have a Bible that you can open up and you can read and you can understand Monday through Saturday and you're not just waiting until Sunday to hear God's Word. So if you don't have a Bible, let me know. We're in the book of Romans today. Romans chapter 12. You know, I'm always blown away when I go to the book of Romans. Several years ago, we did a journey through the book of Romans here. Man, God just used Paul to, to pack every verse <laughs> with incredible stuff in the book of Romans. Amen. And so there's a bunch in here. Yep. Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 3. Because of the kindness that God has shown me, I ask you to not think of yourselves more highly than you should. Instead, your thought should lead you to use good judgment based on what God has given each of you as believers. So we get the context of who he's writing to in this one verse. It's believers. God had just used Paul to write a passage that most of us are pretty familiar with, and that is to, work, to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. And we looked at that some months ago. And so now the Holy Spirit directs Paul to write this, and he, and he begins this phrase with, because of the kindness that God has shown me. Think about that. Because of the kindness that God has shown me, shown you. What if we scratched every reason that we do something good for the church or every reason we do something good for other people? We scratched all those other reasons and we just did it for this one fact because of of the kindness that God has shown me. Hallelujah. What if we never packed another shoebox? There, we never bought another can of green beans or corn because <laughs> the pastor wanted us to, or because Larry wanted us to, or because Savannah shared so good up here and wanted us to. But we just we didn't do it for any other reason 
than because of the kindness that God has shown me. Wow. That, that starts to change things. That starts to change the motivation. You know, I've been told several times through the years about mentors, James, you need to, you need to slow down, you're doing too much, you're going to burn out. And I've even told some other people, other pastors, you need to be careful, you're going to burn out. But you know what I've discovered? It's not how much you do that's going to cause you to burn out. It's the why behind what you're doing. It's the motivation. That's right. You see, if I do what I do to, to please you or somebody else, I, I'm going to burn out. <laughs> <laughs> and if I do what I do to please me or to make me look good, I, I'm going to burn out. But if I do it, because of the kindness that God has shown me, I am never going to burn out because He keeps pouring out kindness to me all the time. Amen. Amen. And so there's a fuel there that keeps fueling my fire because of the kindness that God has shown me. That's right. What would happen in a church? What would happen in this fellowship, Open Arms Fellowship? If, if we change the way we think. You know, the Bible tells us change the way we think, change the way we act. And that's an ongoing process until we, we're not breathing anymore. Because there's always things we've got to change in our thinking and change the way we act. What if we all function under this one thought? I do what I do because of the kindness that God has shown me. You know what? We, we, we wouldn't get an attitude towards some other believers because... They ain't working as hard as I am. You ever got an attitude towards other believers? Yeah, we yeah. have. But if we're doing it because of the kindness God has shown me, I'm not concerned about what the other believers are doing. I'm doing it because God has been so kind. You know, if we did it because of the kindness that God has shown me, I think we'd cut out a lot of complaining. Well, we, we had this work day and someone so didn't show up. And they weren't even there. And that's why I'm doing it anyway. I'm doing it because of the kindness that God has shown me. Amen. And if I'm the only one who shows up, guess what? I'm the one who really gets to show God all the kindness He's shown me. I get to get to say thank you, God, so many ways. That's right. And it would just change our attitude. It would change the whole purpose of why we do what we do. One of the things I do with pastors and church leaders, I was on the phone with a guy a couple of hours the other night, helping them as a church to discover the why behind what they do. See, we get so focused on the what, we forget the why. Why do we do what we do? I do it so I can look good as a church member. I do it because I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to look good. I do it because I'm supposed to. You ever done it that way? <laughs> I don't really want to do it, but I'm supposed to. What if our why is because of the kindness God has shown me? Man, I just, I, I, I just think that's energizing. I think that's fuel on the fire. I just think the church would be dynamic if we just did what we do because of the kindness. God says, you know what, John, it, it would mean that I don't have to go wash the dishes at the Connection on Thursday night. I get to go wash the dishes at the Connection on Thursday night. That's right. It means I don't have to do children's church on my quarter. I get to do children's church in my quarter. It means I don't have to put an offering in the box. You know, it's Christmas coming and it's a tithe and I, got, I need all my... I get to give an offering to the Lord because of His kindness. He showed me. Changes everything. That's right. So because of the kindness that God has shown us, and that really transitions us into the rest of this verse, and it really sets the stage for this whole passage, because of the kindness that God has shown me, we're not to think more highly of ourselves than we should. Now, when we begin to understand this word, we understand why it's saying this. It's interesting, this word to not think highly of yourself actually means to feel out of place. We feel out of place because we're around those people. Y'all know who those people are? Oh yeah. You ever met some, one of those people who, uh, you know, they just kind of thought highly of themselves and you, you knew they did? 
You ever been with those people? Oh, yeah. You know, we're around that, this group of people and, and, and we think maybe we're smarter than they are. Or we're more holy than they are. We're more moral than they are. We're smarter than they are. We smell better than they do. Just, I mean, the list goes on and on. We find ourselves in this group of those kind of people and we just, we feel out of place because we just think we're a little bit better. Because of the kindness that God has shown me, I'm not supposed to think more highly of myself. I'm not supposed to feel out of place with anybody because of God's kindness. I was drawn right back to Jesus. Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, took on flesh, became hungry, became thirsty. And oh, He was so much higher than us. But He never considered Himself that. Jesus walks into Jerusalem with a celebration of people knowing that before the week's over, He's going to die on the cross. Way higher than us that He takes on our sin. Mm -hmm. Never thinking of Himself nope. is higher than us. You see, when we begin to grasp the kindness that God has shown us, we begin to understand that we as humans, we're all on one level plane, sinners in need of one Savior named Jesus. That's right. And we may smell different, look different, have different educations, have different financial st statuses, but guess what? We're all one plane, Amen. sinners in need of one Savior named Jesus. Jesus. You see, when we begin to think of the kindness that God has shown us, we won't think of ourselves more highly than others. But instead, I love, I love God's instead. Every time we see an instead in the Bible, we, that should get our attention because God's saying instead of doing life this way, I, I got something else for you. Instead, based on the gifts God has given us. Now this is really cool. We've got to, got to go back and connect it with that last part of the verse. Instead, your thoughts should lead you to use good judgments based on what God has given each of you. Okay, most of the time when we talk about gifts, and we've been talking about gifts for the last few weeks, and a couple weeks ago we saw all those people standing up here with their posters and they were gift to the church. We immediately think of service to the church. Right? We just do. It's my gift. It's my gift from the Holy Spirit. It's for, for the use of the church. And it is. And we're going to see that in a passage of Scripture in just a minute. But this passage of Scripture right here tells us that our gift actually should be doing something inside of us before we're doing something in the service of the kingdom. That's right. The gift that God so kindly, graciously gave to us should be causing us to change the way we think. The way we judge our judgment. Mm -hmm. It's not just a gift to be used in service. We just, we're service people. Most of us are. We just like, we go to work. Well, there's a time for that. But he's saying, whoop, whoop, no time out here. That gift given by God should humble us so that we don't think too high of ourselves. <laughs> there you go. And cause us to make better judgments because God's been so good to us. Mm -hmm. He's been so good to us. You know, early on when we started the food ministry, and Larry, probably we need to bring it back up. I don't know why we change phrases and we talk about different things, but I remember Larry saying many times, if it weren't for God, we'd be on the other side of that table getting food. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. If it weren't for God, one of us would be in prison. If it weren't for God, if it weren't for God, you see, when we go back, because of the kindness that God has shown me, mm -hmm. all of a sudden it should change every perspective of my life. And our gift 
a gift, use this gratitude to God. Well, let's look at the rest of the passage. Verses 4 and 5. Our bodies have many parts. But those parts don't all do the same thing. In the same way, even though we are many individuals, Christ makes us one body and individuals who are connected to each other. You heard the phrase that, man, that dude's all thumbs, man. He's just all thumbs. <laughs> He's clumsy. He can't hold on to anything. He just, He's out there trying to work and he breaks more stuff than he fixes. He's just all thumbs. I mean, I, I like the thumbs. But if all I had was thumbs, that would sure make using my hands pretty difficult. That's right. We begin to understand that in our physical bodies. Uh, I did something Friday night I've never done before. I love doing stuff I've never done before. Uh, Dylan, my youngest son's workplace, gave him a shower for their upcoming wedding, and he works at an indoor climbing gym. And I've been there a few times, but I never had time to climb. And so I decided I was going to climb because, first of all, it's free because it's awesome. a shower. I don't have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and Dylan's been wanting me to climb, and so I took on the wall and I told him, I said, I want to go to the top. I said, I don't want to, I don't want one that's going to kill me the first time. It is being so hard, but I wanted to go to the top of the roof. I mean, I didn't want to do this little five foot, six foot climb. I'm going to the top. And so he puts me on this one and, and I start climbing and he said it was a pretty hard one and it wasn't too awful bad. I made that climb, whoop, got to the top, and hit the top, and it's like, oh yeah, and then I get to repel down. So he said, well, let's go over to this one, and it's actually supposed to be easier. It wasn't easier. <laughs> I started on that thing and I got about three fourths of the way up. And, you know, you got, your body does things you didn't think were possible. And I'm like this on the side of this wall and, and I'm stuck because I, I can't I can't get to that next part and I'm like, I need an extra arm. <laughs> I need another leg or something. And so Dylan says, Dad, you gotta launch off your right leg. And I'm going, my right leg is doing all it can do right now just to keep me on this wall. <laughs> But he coached me through it, and I was ah, he wanted to push up through it, and I finished that wall too. And, but I just began to realize on that wall how important every part of my body was. Because, man, Amen. my fingers, they had to hang on. And, and my feet had to grip. And, and I got to think, what if, what if we had to choose to give up one part of our body? That would be tough, wouldn't it? I don't know if you ever sat and thought about that. I mean, it's kind of a morbid thought. I've got to give up. I mean, I don't want to do it without a hand. I don't want to do it without an arm. I don't want to do it without a foot. I don't even want to do it without a toe. I mean, I need everything. <laughs> we need everything. We understand that when it comes to our bodies. Look what the Lord wrote through Paul when he said in this passage, in the same way, in the same way that we understand we want all our body parts, in the same way, we are a body. There you go. And we all need our parts. That's right. And sadly, most churches, including this church, we're trying to function while missing vital parts of our body. Heard that. I don't know what it's like to have to live life missing a major part of our body. I've never had to do that. But I see people that maybe they're missing a leg or they're missing one eye. And these veterans who have given up their bodies for our freedom and yet they're, they're making it with one leg or one arm or something like that. I've never had to do this. I really don't know what that struggle's like. But in the same way, the church needs everybody. Because we're part of the body. And we really do. Often, most of the time, churches function, try to function, missing vital parts of their body. Now think about your body. When your body is feeling good, when everything is working good together, man, you feel almost invincible, don't you? That's right. I took on that first wall, and I was like, Man, I could do this. And I was going. I mean, I didn't even slow down on that first wall because everything was working good together. I think the reason the second wall, second wall was so hard because I was tired already. But I was going at it. We just feel like we can go when everything's working good. Could you imagine what a church could do 
if all the parts of the body were working like they should? Man. Could you imagine what even one fellowship, one open arms fellowship, if all the parts of the body were working together? Mm -hmm. What could we do? Man, anything. You know, I've only been here close to 11 years, but, and it's true for any town you live in. You don't have to be here long before everybody complains about their home, their hometown. You know, Hampton's <laughs> this, Hampton's that. Well, Hampton don't have to be what Hampton's always been. That's right. That's right. That's right. And Hampton County don't have to go the way of Allendale County. That's and the right. church will have to play a major part for that not to happen. And when all the body starts working like a body, oh, we can change everything. That's right. Amen. Amen. When the body is working like the body. Mm -hmm. It feels so good that we can accomplish anything. And you know, when I start thinking about this, I get excited because I start dreaming about all that, that I think God wants to do. But, but I don't think it has to be a dream. I think it can be a reality. Because I look out here and I see all that God has given to this body. And you know what? God's Word says He's given us all we need. So we got everything we need right here, right now, to do what God wants us to do. That's right. It just takes all the body parts working together as a single body. What a beautiful picture. We know what it means in our physical body. It's the same thing. In the same way as we start to use our gifts as gratitude to God. Well, look at verses 6 through 8. God in His kindness, there it is again, can't get away from it. God in His kindness gave each of us different gifts. If your gift is speaking what God has revealed, make sure what you say agrees with the Christian faith. If your gift is serving, then devote yourself to serving. If it's teaching, devote yourself to teaching. If it's encouraging others, devote yourself to giving encouragement. If it's sharing, be generous. If it's leadership, lead enthusiastically. If it's helping people in need, help them cheerfully. Again, look at that. God in His kindness. God in His kindness. God is so good to us. How could we not use the gift He has given us as gratitude back to Him? Well, He lists all some gifts here. Now, these are not all the gifts. There's other gifts in different passages. That's right. And we're not really going to look at the gifts today. It's just another time, another message. But I do want us to see a theme in this. And that is, he says, look, if you, if you teach, make sure it aligns with God's Word. And then he, he powerfully he says three times, devote yourself, devote yourself, devote yourself. And look at the other word, generous and, and enthusiastically and, and cheerfully. Amen. You see, when we begin to use our gift that God has given us, it should be done in a way that is filled with joy, filled with excitement, filled with energy. Because why? Because of the kindness that our God has given us. <laughs> And we use our gift just because, we, man, we are psyched. We are jazzed. Mm -hmm. None of this, I have to. <laughs> yeah, think about a gift. You know, it just comes with the nature of family and friends that sometimes we just have to give a gift because we're supposed to, right? Yeah. And we may try to put some thought into it, but that's often when we throw in the re-gift. Yeah? There you go. Yeah, we're supposed to give this person a gift. And you know, we got that thing back there we never use. Oh, we just... <laughs> Wrap it up. But if it's somebody we want to give a gift to, and we're excited about giving the gift to them, we spend some more time and thought about that gift, and we may spend a little extra money in that gift because, man, we want them to open that thing up and go, wow, what a gift. That's right. That's exactly what God is saying in His Word. I've given you a gift. And when you discover your gift, and you put your gift to use, I want you to give it all you got. I want you to devote yourself. I want you to be enthusiastic about it. I want you to gener generously give. I want you all in. That's right. Oh, what a church would look like. Filled with God's gifts. Operating like that. 
Woo! I don't know about y'all, but that'd be a pretty exciting place to be. No doubt. Every moment, every opportunity to go and use my gift becomes another time of joy and excitement. Whatever my gift may be. God's got a theme about His gifts. That's because He's been so gracious, so kind to us. That He wants us to use our gifts to, to, to really change our hearts and attitudes, but to change others because of the Lord's kindness. We get to use our gift. Not, not because the preacher wanted us to. Not ultimately because we want to make the church better, even though that's one of the byproducts. Not even just to help those other people. But what if the goal of using our gift was simply, I want to say thank you, Lord. Wow. I just want to say thank you. Well, if that becomes our motivation, we can't get burned out. We can't get used up. We can't be stopped. Sure can. I just want to say thank you, Lord. You've been so good to me. You've given me so much. I just want to give this gift that you've given me back to you and say thank you, God. Using our gift, this gratitude to God. Look at look at verses nine and ten. Because nine and ten kind of just put the whoo, it puts the icing on the cake on this thing. Love sincerely, hate evil. Hold on to what is good. Be devoted to each other like a loving family. Excel in showing respect for each other. Now, if, if we don't read all this in the context of this passage, it almost looks like, you know, uh, Paul's doing the, the, the losing his thought, being distracted and chasing rabbits, but he's not. Mm -hmm. He's got this beautiful picture of the body of Christ, the family of God, and he's saying, love sincerely, guys. It's got to be real. It's got to be real. You can't just pretend that you love one another. It's got to be the real deal. It's got to be deep. It's got to be meaningful. Love sincerely. Hate evil. Now, understand that's directed at evil, not people. Okay? That's right. We don't hate people. We hate sin. Amen. We hate the evil behind the actions of some people. We, we have a hard time getting that right sometimes. Hold on to what is good. You know, I get a picture here where I'm holding on to something good. That means I can't hold on to something bad. <laughs> 42. My hands are full of good. That means I can't get a hold of nothing bad. Hmm. That's a cool picture. Hold on to what is good. We need to hold on to what is good. Then he says, be devoted. Be devoted. That means to be all in, no reservations. We're sold out. <laughs> We're all in to one another. Relationship. It's all goes back to relationship. Right here in the body. And if there is anybody in this body that we're not in good relationship with today, we need to fix that today. If we don't feel like we're 100% devoted to one another in this body, we don't need to leave this place today without fixing that. That's right. It is sad and it's amazing how mean church people can be to church people. It is sad that so many churches are known by the non-church people in their community as how bad they talk about one another. Mm -hmm. Folks, that is a sin. There's no place for it. And it does way more damage than we comprehend. That's right. We're to be devoted to each other like a loving family. Yep. Sure, every family has squabbles. I know this. I don't like yours. But we're devoted to each other. Don't leave here without clearing up any lack of devotion you have for family members. And then he says, I love this one, excel, excel in showing respect for one another. You know, this really takes us back to verse 3 where it says, don't think too highly of yourself, right? 
Because if we think it too highly of ourselves, we're not really showing much respect for one another. And he, you know, he's talking about a body, and I, and I got to thinking about this. You ever stumped your toe? Oh, I know you have. Of it hurts more when you're older, don't it? I mean, just oh. <laughs> yeah. You ever stumped your toe? You got so mad, I stumped my toe. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut that stupid toe off. It's hurt me. I'm done with it. I'm done with that crazy toe. I stumped it. It hurt me. I'm never put up with it anymore. Ain't gonna happen. Well, you know that toe only went where the foot took it. <laughs> the foot only went where the leg took it. And the leg only took it where the body took it. And the body only took it where the brain took it. <laughs> we're all one body. And we're to respect one another equally. Because we're equally important. And just because somebody hurts our feelings or says something about us, we don't cut them off and want nothing to do with them ever again. They hurt our feelings. I ain't talking to them anymore. Is that what we're going to do when we stump our toe? We cut it off. I ain't got nothing to do with it anymore. In the same way, your body is one. We got to excel and show them respect for every part of our body. Because every part of our body is needed and we need each other. And no one is of a better position than the other one. That's right. Excel in showing respect for one another. And then he ends this little passage here in verse 11. Man, verse 11, I could actually spend the day on verse 11. Don't be lazy in showing your devotion. Use your energy to serve the Lord. Now, in my house, my mama didn't put up with much laziness. And I was blessed to have a lazy young brother who got all the heat because he was lazier than I was. <laughs> And we had a famous statement that was made famous by my daddy called Snap, Crackle, Pop. Because that's what my mother was doing to my little brother most of the time because he was lazy. Snap, Crackle, Pop. Because <laughs> my little brother had this attitude that if you told me to do something, I say yes, but I get to do it on my own time. Oh. Mm, don't work with mama. No. <laughs> so he got to Snap, Crackle, Pop a lot. Don't be lazy. How many of us have been lazy in our devotion to God? You know, we, we don't think much about laziness in our culture because our culture has taught us we, we deserve to veg out. we got you know, a gazillion channels we can flip through and watch absolutely nothing while accomplishing absolutely <laughs> nothing. And we think we're due that time. And I'm not saying we don't need some, some chill out time, but folks, this is talking about our devotion to God and one another. And I don't know about you, but I don't want God, when He's going to assess my life, to say, James, you are awful lazy. Remember all the kindness that I gave you? Remember that gift I gave you? Remember my son shed his blood for you? And the Holy Spirit came to you when you called out as a sinner in forgiveness and He brought to you a, a special gift and you were lazy. <laughs> Folks, I do what I do not to be an impressive pastor or, or to accomplish some list of goals I have. I do what I do because I don't want to be found lazy to God. Amen. I don't want that. And I've got a lot more plans and a lot more stuff I plan to do for one reason. I don't want to be seen lazy in the eyes of God. That's right. That scares me. Mm -hmm. I know He's gracious. I know He's forgiving. But He told me, don't be lazy. And there have been times in my life 
multiple times when I actually stopped and said, God, how am I being lazy? And it's usually those times when I don't know what I'm supposed to do next because I've been lethargic. <laughs> lazy. <laughs> and God, what am I supposed to do? Well, you're not supposed to keep doing nothing. What if we, on a daily basis, we're not asking one another, we're not getting people's Facebook opinion of us. <laughs> we're asking God. God, where am I being lazy at in my life? And we heard God. And we did something about it. There you go. Woo! That's going to change our day. <laughs> there you go. And because we're one body, that's going to change our church. And because we're a church and a community, that's going to change our community. Ain't no puzzle. Just because you stop being lazy in that area. Mm -hmm. And look what he says. Use your energy to serve the Lord. I really could. I think I could go for about an hour on that place, folks. But I just want to pose one question to us. Who's the recipient of most of our energy? Now you've got to answer that one on your own. Who's the recipient of, of your energy from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. Who's the, who's the major recipient of your energy? I don't know. you got to answer that for yourself. But, but i got a notion most of us are not going to like our answer. I can tell you mine. It's me. And that ain't what God said. He said, use your energy to serve me, not yourself. Easy phrase. <laughs> Tough to live out. Using our gift is gratitude to God. We use our energy to serve the Lord. Folks, we really are the most blessed people on earth. Amen. If we're an American, and we're an American Christian, it doesn't get any better than this, folks. And I know we all got concerns about our nation, and we should. And we better be praying for our nation. But we're still the most blessed people on earth. We are. So how can we say thank you? When we think about all the kindness that God has shown us, how can we say thank you? So, if you've been given a gift if you're a believer in Christ, would you say you're using your gift in gratitude to God? If not, what do you need to do today, this morning, to say, God, I want to say thank you. And I'm going to use the gift you've given me to say thank you. Maybe for you today, the first step in recognizing the gift God has given you is Jesus Christ. You know, I know you know His name, but think about this. Jesus Christ died on a cross for us, and if we never accept Him as Lord and Savior, we have scoffed at the gift of God. We just ignore it. It's just like there. Oh yeah, I know about Jesus. It's a present. It's a gift. But I ain't got time for Him. That's not thankfulness. Maybe today your very act of thankfulness is to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and say, I want you, Lord and Savior, my life. That's right. Maybe today you just want to say thank you. Mm -hmm. What does that look like for you? 